Welcome to Quick Show. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how postmodern critical theory is a virus, a, an ideological virus. This is not in my words. This is in the words of many that push postmodern critical theory. In order to understand what is going on here, what I want to do is I want to refer back to one of the fathers of postmodernism, which has a, a large amount of infusion into critical theory, who is Jacques Derrida, and talk about his virology, if you will. Secondly, I'm going to give an example from queer theory, which is based in critical theory, and then we're going to go to women's studies, also based in critical theory, with a good infusion of postmodernism. These three examples here, written by uh, all three in academia, in their own words, will tell you a lot about critical theory and where we are today with this. But first, we need to look at a few words that are important. We want to trace back the DNA of certain words so that we can get an idea of what this virus does and what it does with language, with words. First, we have to go back to Kant. And with Kant, the German philosopher, we, we get the term critique. This is a way of argument. It's an art of argument. And he's the one that provides really the legacy of this term critical, as in critical theory or critical race theory. From there, we can go to Hegel. And with Hegel, we get dialectic. Dialectic is very important. You're going to see these words, critical and dialectic, all the time from the critical race theorists and all critical theorists in all of these academic departments of identity politics and what we might call postmodern critical theory or critical social justice. Hegel gives us dialectic. Dialectic is basically saying you have a thesis or in certain order or assumption of something, you're then going to provide antithesis, which is an opposing view, and then you end up somewhere in the middle with synthesis. The thing is, is that this becomes an art form for the critical theorists. So they will critique, in a sense, the dialectic here over to a certain place and then settle for a little bit at a determined place in the middle. But once they have it there, they then do it again. And so now where it was at point A and they're arguing point from point C, then it stops at point B. Right, this, this new understanding of things. Well, then they're going to go, once it's at point B, they now count that as point A. And they move to a point C. And then they settle to a new point B. And it keeps getting further and further along toward where they want it to be. That is an agenda-driven argument. A, a, that's called Hegelian dialectic. Very, very important. Because this is the, this is the form of thinking that their pedagogy, which is a, a, a word that is also an important word, that, that is how we teach people. And when you look in the, a lot of the critical race theory curriculum, and yes, there is critical race theory curriculum everywhere, you will see that term of, of dialectic and critical. What they are trying to do is get students to think in a dialectical manner, in a critical with a capital C manner. So Kant is critical. That's where we get critical from. And then we have uh, uh, Hegel with dialectic. And then you go to Marx, who also uses Kant's critique or critical. And his critical would be of political economy, right? The economic classes. That's where he works from. He also adds another word, Marx does, called praxis. This is practice or Really, in our modern term, it's activism. And, and he uses it in a way that says, okay, it's not just a matter of gaining the knowledge, but we need to see how it's going to pract practice, how it's going to be practicable. And the way you get it there is through activism. 
So that's crucial to understand because that legacy of Marx continues on through the schools, through academia, until you get to the critical race theorists. The Frankfurt School in the early 20th century, who came up with the term critical theory, also used critical from Marx and Kant. It's the same DNA. It's the same idea. It's a, we, we can look at it as, a, as a, a Hegel's argument, but it's an art of argument. It's a critique. It means to criticize everything. And, and, to, and focus, the way you do that is focus on the negative, on anything that is negative. Race has gotten better. Race relations have gotten better over time. No, race is worse than it ever was. That's the idea of critical. That's the idea of trying to move to a new place, a new argument. Use Hegelian dialectic to continue to move the argument downstream. Horkheimer, who is probably the main ideological thrust of the Frankfurt School, which is, which is just a bunch of Marxists, he described that any theory that would be critical or any, anything that makes a critical theory is one that seeks to liberate, another very important word. Look for that. When you see liberate, you, you'll understand that it is, it is anchored back into this DNA, into this legacy. Any theory that liberates human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Okay, so, so that's what critical theory is. And so today what we end up with is this monster, which I call a hydra, because the hydra is all critical theory, and it's infused with postmodernism. You have a head that is critical race theory. That's the largest head of the hydra. Another head that would be queer theory. Another head that would be women's studies. Another head that is gender studies. And then it just goes on and on and on. And it's kind of like this idea of, of a perverted university that is, uh, you have all these department heads and they all start grabbing on to this critical theory. It's all based in, in similar tenets of, of an ideology. And then they all have kind of their separate heads, but they're all part of the same monster. Now, the first example that I want to go to is Jacques Derrida. He is one of the probably three most important uh, postmodernists. You have Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and Lyotard, right? And, and so those three are kind of the fathers of, of postmodernism. Here's what he says. All I have done, this is in his work. He passed away in 2004, was born in 1930. So that gives you an idea of his, his time frame. He really took off in the 70s after Solzhenitsyn had really shown how horrible the Soviet Union was treating people and how, hey, this, this, this Marxist utopia really isn't working out. That's kind of where, not totally, but that's, that's a, that was really a push forward for postmodernism at that time, coming primarily out of Paris and France. He says, all I have done is dominated by the thought of a virus. These are his words. He gives this interview here in 1994. So he's 64 years old, more or less, right? 64 years old. He's had the bulk of his career behind him. All that I have done is dominated by the thought of a virus. What could be called a parasitology, a virology, the virus being many things. Now he goes on. The virus is in part a parasite that destroys. Now you need to think about ideas. You need to think about an ideology. And this is going to give you a clue as to how all of this movement, this critical social justice, this postmodern critical theory works. They're bought into this system. They're bought into how this works. It says this virus is in part a parasite that destroys, that introduces disorder into communication. Now, Jacques Derrida was focused on literary uh, on, on literature and being a literary critic and, and language, right? That's, that's his focus. So what he's done is he comes in and he tries to create a virus in our language. So the code, think of this as a computer, the coding would be our language, how we speak to each other. And he is a virus 
that inserts himself into the code to try and dismantle, to, as he puts it, deconstruct, deconstruct the operating system, the language of the computer or our language, okay? So look at this ideology in their own words and what they do. Now, some of you are going to argue that know a little bit more about this, that critical theory doesn't have a lot to do with postmodernism or critical uh, uh, race theory doesn't have a lot to do. That's not true. There are tenets that are brought in from all of these philosophies and, and, and that, are, that are very similar, that are all rooted in the same place. Some of them butt heads with each other, and, and some of the heads of the Hydra use more postmodernism, like with Jacques Derrida, than others, and some completely refute it, but most of them all bring in a little bit of postmodernism. And you're going to see here how other disciplines use this idea of the virus as well. Now follow up, now follow along here on this second idea from Derrida. He says, what I do with words is make them explode so that the nonverbal appears in the verbal. What he's saying here is that he can change everything that goes along with a word. You see a word, let's say it's dog, D-O-G. And if you can put a virus in there, then the body of that word, that's the, the, everything that is, pre- all the meaning that is pregnant in that word can then be changed. It is deconstructed into something different. He says, I explain myself with the bodies of words. It's what goes along with the word. The, the word you can look at with the letters and all that, that's the skeleton. But the actual word is more of a body around that that has meaning to it. And lastly, his comment here, the virus is in part a parasite that destroys, that introduces disorder into communication. Now, the word parasite really means eating at another's table. That's really what it is. It is someone who is dependent on somebody else. So whether it was a pejorative at first or not, it, it, it means that you are dependent on someone else. You need their food to live. It's the same thing with a virus, right? You are, you are dependent upon a host, a host that creates some type of order already. So typically there is probably some good to the host, to the idea. Something that produces and gives life on its own. A virus comes in and sucks the life out. It mimics the host to some degree and then alters it. It changes it. This is what postmodern critical theory does. And we're going to show you exactly what they mean by this and how they accomplish it. Think of the term social justice. Now, many of us may have used that 20, 30 years ago to mean something very different. And in our minds, a very literal meaning of social justice is something that we would all agree upon. Of course we want social justice. But that is not what is meant when social justice is typically brought up, is it? You know it's not. There is something else, a body to that phrase, that goes along with it. There is a specific movement that has appropriated that phrase, that term, And it it acts as if it's the only way to accomplish that movement is the only way to accomplish social justice as if, as if everybody else, right, is, is seeking for some other different type of justice. And remember with this, with critical social justice, it is the antithesis. This is very important. It is the antithesis of the civil rights movement. It is not Martin Luther King. It is not being colorblind. It is the exact opposite. They will tell you over and over again that being colorblind is a horrible thing. And this is the same thing that's happening with critical race theory, that term. People are conflating it with the idea of what we would think of as a proper social justice, something that everybody can apply to and and it's applied universally. They don't believe in that. 
Critical theory fights that idea off. It rejects it. But to them, there is no other way to accomplish a type of justice for everybody unless it is through critical race theory. So if you say you don't believe in critical race theory, the body of that word, they're, they're, they're going to say that, well, are you racist? As if it's the only way to accomplish it. The term has been appropriated not in its meaning, but in its encompassing solution, which it, it is not an encompassing solution. Now, I want to go to another example here. This is from a, an academic paper written on queer theory, which is a, one of the heads of the hydra, right? It is a form of critical theory. And it's called fetishizing the health sciences, right? This enters into everything. You'll see how in a minute. Queer theory as an intervention. The intervention they're talking about here is a virus. Here is what Tyler M. Arguello in 2016 writes. Queer theory also recasts the meanings of viral and hybrid identities, or those identities that operate within Western scientific rationales. That's, that's where they're going after, right? This is all about Western liberal democracy coming out of the Enlightenment and Christianity, right? That's, that's the bottom line. That's what they're after. He continues, queer theory looks to dislodge the concordance through insistent adoption of viral processes. This is their own words. Of viral processes of rapid transformation, mutation, and momentary identity, processes against which the normative processes against which the normative subject wishes to defend itself. On one level, the end game of queer theory would be to use these viral processes as a way to infect and hence transform the body politic. They know exactly what they're doing. Nobody here is inferring the idea that what they're doing is infectious as in the sense of a virus. They are telling you that this is a virus. They want it to be a virus. They want to use the metaphor of a virus for their ideology. This is what they believe. Let me go to another example here. And this time, we're going to take a look at uh, the source here. I'll have you take a look. This is from Heneros. It's a multidisciplinary journal of gender studies. Now, here you're going to see that you have an exact uh, uh, view if you're if you're on if you're on on YouTube here of of what this is. This is from the source. This is not me. I keep trying to tell you guys this. This is this is they don't hold back. They are unabashedly proud of this being a virus. They are unabashedly proud of this being tyrannical. They are unabashedly proud of it being radical and sourced from Marxism and critical theory and postmodernism. There is, I would say, between the academics, those that really come up with this stuff and push it and fortify it, between them and you, there is a, a flexible uh, uh, gel-like substance that can change form because it pulls out right where it needs to. It pulls out all of the ugly stuff and then relates it over to you. And then what you get is this pretty package that says, we want everybody to have equity. We want diversity. We want inclusion. Because we all do. We all want those things. But they don't show you what's in the package. You learn little by little what is inside the pretty box with a bow on it. And that is why... Many people, when you talk about how you have this sense that this critical race theory and critical theory overall has really got problems with it, those that might come back at you, all they see right now is the pretty box and the pretty bow. Now, some of them may have seen a little bit of what's inside here, but most of them do not get everything that is here. That is done in a way 
that has to be trained and taught. You will see that in this paper, the way that they train and teach students. And they're very blatant about it. Now, this comes from women's studies, but this is the same thing in every critical theory that you're going to find. Every discipline, every head of the hydra is the same thing. And over time, I'll show you more and more examples from different departments and different studies, different critical departments that talk about these types of things. By the way, you're going to get the same thing in different words, not fully different words, but mostly different words in, in the curriculum trying to be passed at K-12 schools. I've read it. Very, very concerning. So this here then is uh, Women's Studies as Virus. That is the name of the paper. Institutional Feminism and the pro Projection of Danger. Now, again, this isn't the watered-down feminism of, I can't remember her name right now, Hermione, right, where she's out looking for the betterment of women around the globe and things like that, right? She's not a radical. There, you have to have distinctions here. This is radical. But this is where it all kind of sources from. This is where all where it pushes from. Women's studies as virus, institutional feminism, and the project of danger. This is not someone writing about feminism as a pejorative type of paper, as a criticizing type of paper. This, these are the authors that are of the departments that are talking about this as women's studies as a virus. They're proud of it. Okay, this is Brianne Foz and Michael Carger right here of Arizona State. University, 2016. Okay, so let's get to this. I've highlighted some of this. Let's just read the abstract here. And this is a little bit lengthy, but I think, I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Because women's studies radically changes social hierarchies and lacks a unified identity and canon of thought, it often negotiates a precarious position within the modern corporatized university. So they're looking at the university here, first of all, as a... Um, as a corporate structure. It's important for them to see because, again, it's going against capitalism. That's how they want to look at this. They are going to be the virus, not just in society, but first in the university to change the universities. Ask yourself is, if this has happened over the last 20, 25 years. Exactly what they're going to describe here is exactly what happened. At the same time, women's studies offers, by virtue of its interdisciplinary, critical, that should be a capital C there, right? Critical is that DNA word coming down through those philosophers and the, those uh, um, political ideologies. And in critical and infectious structure. So here you're getting a parallelism of critiquing, of criticizing, of critical, as in critical theory, with being infectious. That's important to understand. They go together. A virus breaks down a cell and alters it. That is what this is. That is what critical is. Um, critical and infectious structure, cutting edge perspectives and goals that set it apart from the more traditional fields. This paper theorizes that one future pedagogical priority, pedagogy, is, is the way that you teach. This is all about activating students. It's the same exact thing in K-12. to When you see pedagogy, there are other ways to teach people, but it's all, in these critical studies here, it almost always is talking about a critical form of teaching and indoctrinating kids that makes them activists. That's the way it's used. And it's part of the infection. It's part of the virus. So on future pedagogical or certain way of teaching kids priority of women's studies is to train studies not only to master a body of knowledge, but also to serve as symbolic viruses. This is their own words. Symbolic viruses that infect, unsettle, and disrupt traditional and entrenched fields. This is what happened to the universities. The universities used to be liberal and I get a lot of comments from people on the right that are saying, hey, you know, all those libs or why, you know, why are people so liberal? How can people be liberal and members of the church? Or you know, it's like, come on, 
this is you're 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 stuck in the 1990s. This stuff here is a completely different animal. And if you're going to fight this as a liberal versus conservative type of a, of an argument, you're going to be in real trouble because that is not what this is. And if you're on the left and you're a liberal, if you don't look to your left flank and and make a clear distinction between classical liberalism which is very important in our society and illiberal postmodern critical theory you're going to find yourself shortly in a place where this hydra has consumed everything on the left and and that can't happen it just can't happen okay in this essay we first posit how the metaphor of the virus in part exemplifies an ideal feminist pedagogy. There's the word again. Again, the pedagogy is how to indoctrinate and activate. That's what pedagogy is. That's how it's used. How do we indoctrinate, infect, virally infect, and activate the students okay, to also be viruses? Okay, so I'm going to stop there as far as the, the, the abstract goes on the paper, and we're going to get down to a few points here in the nitty-gritty on this. And again, if you are on YouTube, then you can see exactly what I am going through right now uh, on this paper. This is not me making anything up. I don't do that. A lot of people, uh, not a lot, a few people um, claimed that I was making up the video on the BYU professor. <laughs> I don't do that. Right? I, I, I don't do that. And by the way, just as a side note here, I did have a lot of people asking me to, to divulge the name of the professor at BYU that equated President Nelson with critical race theory and, and anti-racism with Ibram Kendi. I'm not going to do that. And, and please understand that you are probably the same person that fights against cancel culture. But it can't just be one-sided. Right? You can't have cancel culture if you're on the right just against the left and, and say fight cancel culture when it comes from the left. You've got to fight it on your own side too. Right Now, I completely disagree with what that professor said. And, and, and he maybe needs to be fired. I don't know. But... I know he's got a family. I know he's got a family. And I'm not going to put him out to the mob by divulging his name. I, 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 I hope you can understand that. If he comes out publicly, then I'll put his name out there publicly. And by the way, he's one of many. There are, there's much more to come on that end. Okay. Okay, here we get back to the pedagogy, and you're going to see a different term here this time. This paper argues that one future pedagogical priority of women's studies is to train students not only to master a body of knowledge, but also to serve as symbolic viruses that infect, unsettle, and disrupt traditional and entrenched fields. Okay, we got that in the abstract. Remember the word praxis that we had from Marx. Right? That's why Marxism is, is not just an idea or, or a political point of view. It is a worldview. It is, it, when you become a Marxist or you become an anti-racist or you become a critical race theorist, it is a conversion process. You are being converted to a new religion. That is what is happening. It is an overall, all-consuming religion and, and worldview, which is why you're told with anti-racism, as an example, that you know you need to find it in every single situation. That's what Robin DiAngelo tells you, that there, it, it's not if racism happened, it's where do you see it? You have to find it everywhere. It is a worldview. It is a religion that people are converted to. That's the virus. You become converted and then you convert those around you. We explore how the metaphor of the virus, its structure, and its potential for unsettling and disrupting the everyday processes of its host exemplifies a compelling model for feminist pedagogy 
minus, of course, the killing of the host. Why don't they want to kill the host with a virus? They need the host. You've got to have the host. What is the host? Well, in the West, here they're talking about a, 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 the university. Well, they can't get rid of the university. They can infect it, which they have nationwide, everywhere. It's all, the virus is everywhere, right? It is, it is in, in, to use a, another metaphor, it's, it's, all, it's, it's the zombie apocalypse at every, almost every university nationwide. A large portion of them have been infected with critical theory. They've been converted. But also in a grander scale, it is Western liberal democracy. That is what they are trying to pull down. That is the heritage. That is the DNA of these movements. All right, to the next comment here. We're just going to do a couple more. So in this section, they put the question mark of women's studies as virus. Well, their answer to their own rhetorical question here is yes. Here's what they say. Given the tremendous potential to produce emotional responses in others, to directly impact students' lives, this is not to teach them knowledge, right? This is, this is to make them activists. To directly impact student lives and to elicit emotion in the course content, right? They want to build up the outrage is what they're trying to do. What then are the pedagogical priorities of women's studies? In other words, what are the training priorities? The way we teach students, what are those priorities in women's studies? We posit that one future pedagogical goal of women's studies is the creation of students as symbolic viruses, capable, capable of infecting and unsettling the academic spaces around them. Have we seen this on campuses across the country? All right, and then talking about how a virus works, you know, inserting its DNA or RNA into a cell. It says, after replication, right, it's replicating it but altering the cell, portions of the viral DNA are left behind permanently within the cell DNA strands. Leading to genetic, these are their own words, ex- genetic, leading to genetic expressions that have been proposed to cause cancer, audio, autoimmune disorders, and neurological disease. And then this is important because this is how this is working today. This is how postmodern critical theory, critical social justice is moving through everything, through all the institutions. Inherently opportunistic, viruses exploit the vulnerabilities and weaknesses of the system systems they attack. That's exactly how a virus works. Similarly, Women's studies programs are allowed to settle into corporate universities and regenerate themselves through the education of students, the pedagogy there, the training of students, and by manipulating portions of the academy under their control. You can't make this stuff up. Most people, if I'm not showing you the source here, you would not believe, I don't think, that this is real. But it's everywhere. It's, it's in their own words everywhere. They're not hiding anything. The media hides it. And if there's a feeling of, hey, we need to, how far do we go with the students here at this point? How far do we go in writing a certain book, a certain presentation? Well, sometimes they hold back a little bit. Pull out the ugly stuff. Just show the the pretty packaging. And remember, this can be any critical theory department. This can be queer theory. This can be critical race theory. They all do the same thing in infecting the rest of the university and the rest of society. It continues. Using interdisciplinary women's studies coursework as a springboard, women's studies students, those that have been indoctrinated and activated, are then set loose, much in the same way that lytic replication wherein cells reproduce viral components until the cell walls rupture, causes a burst of new viruses into the system that then infect other cells. This, friends, is critical theory. This is exactly what is happening. And if you have students at universities, including BYU, I, I hate to say, they're getting infected with this. Some more than others, right? Some barely hear it, but it's there. And and there's those that are completely converted. And yes, even at BYU. 
Now, here again, we get to the training and indoctrination of the students. Note that this model also assumes that students do not merely receive information. In other words, I'm not just going to teach you. That they don't, that they not merely receive information as in the more traditional disciplines. That would be in the liberal, small l, the liberal uh, uh, pedagogy of let me show you this information here and teach you about things. That would be the liberal tradition that we have uh, in the United States. Again, when I say liberal there, I'm not talking about a left or a right side. I'm talking about liberal democracy. I'm talking about liberal in the sense that we want to give all the information out to everybody. So again, note that this model also assumes that students do not merely receive information as in the more traditional disciplines, but instead that they utilize information and knowledge systems to develop particular skills. Being an activist. That's what that is. It is here it is right here. To develop particular skills, intentions, and insurrectionary priorities. You wonder about a lot of these protests at, at universities and where this comes from. This is exactly what comes from Saul Alinsky and, and Marcusa in the 60s, later on, right? That's, that's, that's what this is. They are converted to be activists. All right, they continue, believe it or not. These infectious students carrying the blueprints of feminist pedagogies carrying the blueprints of how to be an activist and how to train other people, step into other programs and reconstitute themselves. So they can be a student in another department and they start being an activist and try, start trying to transform. They're told to do this. That's what they're being told in their classes, to do this, to be disruptive. That it, it, this is, it's not just let me learn something. That is not how these critical theories work. That is why Ibram Kendi does not allow you to be an assimilationist. That's why he hates what Martin Luther King teaches about being colorblind. Because for him, he uses a new pretty word called anti-racist, which is simply, I'm going to give you a certain pedagogy here of how to be an activist and how to turn around and make others activists as well. It's the same thing. So, these infectious students carrying the blueprints of feminist pedagogies step into other programs and reconstitute themselves through the work they submit and through interaction with instructors and student peers. This is how it worked. This is how they spread throughout the universities over the last 20 years. This infects the formerly isolated and protected traditional disciplines, such as history, mathematics, physics, psychology, and so on. They are all, all infected at this point, everything. Unwittingly, then, the corporate university begins to integrate, bit by bit, portions of feminist pedagogies, or again, it can be critical race theory pedagogies, it can be queer theory pedagogies, anything that's using critical theory, it's the same exact thing. Uh, bit by bit, portions of feminist pedagogies into its own ideology. As the perpetual expansion of the corporate university builds upon itself, it carries these alien blueprints into new domains. Look at what is happening to corporate America now. Look what is happening to sports and entertainment, the news media, Hollywood, religion, Christianity. This is all. This, it's kind of like this, this, the viruses are in the, in the academy and they've just all kind of been released from that cell. And, and they're, they're, they've burst out and they're bursting out every year as they graduate. And they're going out into these, these other domains, as, as we're told here. I, I hope you can see what is going on and, and, and how blatant this is. You, you're, you might think to yourself, well, this really isn't happening to my kid, my grandchild at school. It's, it's not happening, you know, at their university. They're not, they're not uh, exposed to these things. Well, maybe they're not. You know, it might not be. I don't think everybody is. But understand the aggressive nature of this. If you read the, the curriculum for the board-approved California curriculum for high schools, and see what they talk about. It is all about activism. 
It is taking the students and making them activists. It is indoctrinating those three points, right? That's what I see. The three points that you find in their pedagogy, their training, is uh, indoctrination, number one. Secondly, it is, it is a, a dialectic critical thinking. They, they've got to get you into that mode of thinking that way to break things down, going all the way from dialectic to critical with a capital C, right, to uh, Derrida's deconstruction. That's, that's what it is. It's to break everything down. And then third is activism. That, those three things are what they focus on. And it's, and it's relentless. It is over the top what they say. So take this episode as hyperbole if you want. Um, but I think that as you follow this series and I go through this, you're going to see more and more from their own words how, how these different critical theorists are, are, uh, believe who they are and what their goal is and what they're trying to accomplish. The episode I'm coming out with here shortly on, on you're basically a guide to postmodern critical theory, most of that is going to be excerpts of critical theorists in their own words, not me. I've had a number of people comment on, on, on the episode saying, well, you don't have any proof of this. Yeah, I, I do. I have a lot of proof of this. It's not what you think it is. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.